Hi, recently ChatGPT has taken the world by storm. In this video, I'll present a walkthrough tutorial on building a GPT-like model. By the end, we will generate some poems about cats. We will also discuss some new concepts beyond GPT. I believe everyone should learn about neural networks because it has relation to many fields. I am interested as a neuroscientist because it gives me more insight into how AI and the brain can inspire each other. I will try my best to avoid this and provide a gradual transition between the concepts. I assume zero knowledge in machine learning. If you know some programming, you can follow along. If not, you can still learn from the illustrations and the analogies. Let's start. Open your Python interpreter. If you don't have one, I suggest downloading Anaconda. After installing, open Anaconda prompt and type spider. The IDE opens. On the left side, type print hello world. Press the green button above to run it. If you see hello world on the right side, we are ready to code. You can also select each line, right click and run the selection. Intelligence is about predicting the outcomes. Let's take this simple example. Your brain tries to associate the switches with the lights after observing the events. One way to model that is using the good old-fashioned AI. We define a button and then model the conditional events using if-else statements. But this can quickly get messy as the number of the conditions increases. Also, there is no obvious way to make this model learn from the data. Another approach is perceptron. For simplicity, let's do one light for now. Change off to zero and on to one. Here we use the weighted sum of the events, then threshold the result and use it to predict the outputs. But different buttons have different relations with the lights. We can add the relations to our model too. All we need now to predict the output is to model the relations correctly. Now let's simplify the variable names. X's are our inputs, W's are weights or relations, and the result is Y. This can still get tedious if we add more inputs. NumPy can help. So import NumPy as MP. Now you can put all the inputs into X's array. Put all the weights into W's array. Now you can simply type Y equal X's dot W's. The add sign here is the dot product, which calculates the weighted sum of all the inputs, just like below, but in a much more compact way. Now we simplified this, so remove it. In real life, the relations are hidden from us. Comment the weights out. We can only observe the inputs and their outcomes. To predict the outcome, we need to figure out the relations. This is what learning is about in machine learning. But to figure out the weights, we need more than one event to observe. Let's observe a few more inputs and outputs. Now that's enough to figure out the relations between these inputs and outputs. If we figure out the weights, I mean the relations, we can predict the output for new inputs like this input or this one. Delete this. We have now an optimization problem to solve. The number of inputs is five. The number of outputs is one. To find the correct weights, we need to search for the right combination. You can think of the solution as a multidimensional point. Searching here is not different from geographical searching in which your search space is only two dimensions. One approach is random search. Let's define the initial weight as a random set of numbers. W's equal to weights with the size of the inputs by outputs. Let's print our random guess. The correct weights are hidden, so we don't know if our guess is correct or not. We need a feedback. We can get a global feedback by checking the predictions from our guess and then comparing the output YH with the expected output YS. The sum of the absolute errors can be used as the global feedback. If it reached the threshold below 0.05, then we found the solution. Else, we make another random guess. Let's try random guessing for 5,000 iterations. Let's record the outcomes in this array. To plot the results, we need to type this and import matplotlib library like this. After running the simulation, you can see we haven't found the solution. 
and none of our 5000 iterations came close to our threshold of 0.05. The minimum error is 0.8. This brute force search becomes worse with more dimensions and more variables. So what can we do to find the needle in the haystack? A simple approach comes from evolution. Here we record the current error. The father makes a child. The child's location is slightly and randomly mutated. The child's error is assessed. If the child's error is more than the current error, then the child is removed. The father makes another child. We repeat the process. If the child's error is less than the current error, now the father can rest in peace. The child grows to become a father. The error is updated. If you repeat that, one day you reach the goal. Let's implement this. Define mutation as a small random set of weights. Copy the original weights and rename them as CW for child weights. Rename E to CE for child error. Compare the child error with the original error and select the better weights for the next iteration. Let's run. The error is reducing but stuck right above our threshold. Let's reduce the mutation amount. Now it found the solution. Let's break the loop. The last error is now below 0.05 and the solution YH is close to the true solution YS. The guest weights are also close to the true weights, which were hidden from us. Now let's make an arbitrary output where we don't know if we can even find the solution with a linear regression. Let's rerun. No solution is found and the last error is high. Let's add a bias term because our data are not centered on zero. Bias terms are additional ones added at the end of the inputs and they are necessary to model the shifts in the data. The error is still above the threshold. The reason is our simple network can only find linear relationships between the inputs and the outputs. But if the relation is nonlinear, then we can't find a solution because we cannot fit a line to a curve, no matter what slope or shift we try. To solve this, we need to add two things. First, another layer of weights connected to some middle nodes Second, apply a nonlinear activation function to the middle neurons. You can use any activation function from this list, but I prefer sine waves. We know from Fourier transform that we can approximate any signal by adding together different sine waves. Let's implement that. Add WI, which takes the inputs to the nodes. Now WS are getting their input from the nodes. Define 15 nodes. Dot product the X's with the WI. Then apply the sine wave to generate nonlinearity. Let's add that to the child network too. But we need to change this to nodes. Let's rerun. Oh, we get an error because we accidentally changed the initial input x. Let's rename all the intermediary results to x and only keep the initial inputs as x. Rerun. Yes, we found the solution again. And the error is below the threshold. Let's reduce the number of nodes to 5 and rerun. Now no solution is found. It looks like we need more than 5 nodes to solve this problem within 5000 iterations. This is a simple problem and it can be solved with fewer parameters if you have a better search for a more optimal solution. We can use parallel computing to find better solutions faster. For example, the father can make several children at once and we select the best ones to breed and they too can make more children in parallel. This way, we can reach the solution faster. However, this requires sacrificing a lot of children, and that's horrible and immoral. Shameless DNA has been doing this for billion years. Now we live in the age of brain. Individual lives matter, so we need to find a better way. First, take advantage of the error magnitude, which is known to us. Second, even though it's dark and you don't know the direction towards the global maxima, but you can follow the steepest path from your immediate surroundings. Use derivatives to infer the direction of the steepest slope. From calculus, we know that derivative of x is 1, the derivative of x squared is 2x, the derivative of sine is cosine, and so on. Apply the derivative to the error and update the weights by the error. Some nodes have higher activities and contribute more to the error, so it makes sense to scale the update amount for each weight by x. One important note, the magnitude of the error doesn't tell how far we are from the solution, but it tells how steep your direction is. 
That's why you may overshoot the solution and the error plot will look noisy. Therefore, you need to scale down the gradients by another factor. It will take longer to reach the solution, but at least it won't overshoot the target. Let's implement that. Update the weights like this. The derivative of the output is just one because we haven't applied nonlinearity to the last output. Okay, now we know to learn from our mistakes. We don't need to sacrifice children, so delete this part. Rerun the code. We found the solution in just 300 iterations. Let's remove the break and run for the whole 5000 iteration. The error rate is almost reaching zero after 5000 iteration. Cool. Let's see if we can find the solution with five nodes. Yes, the error is below 0.05. Let's see if we can find the solution with two nodes. Unfortunately, we can't. The error stuck around six. Because you follow the steepest direction in the immediate surroundings, you may get stuck on a nearby local maximum. That's why more nodes can help. More nodes means more dimensions. If you follow the local evidence in more dimensions, you may find a solution eventually. But we can do better. So far, we only fine-tuned the outer layer. If we fine-tune the inner layer too, we may capture the hierarchical structures and be able to model with fewer parameters. For example, you need at least 15 parameters to model 5 triple letters. However, if you add hierarchy, you can share the common pair with all the other letters. This can reduce the number of the parameters dramatically, especially when modeling deeply nested structures. Fine-tuning the inner layer is similar to that of the outer layer, except now we need to propagate the errors backward. Rename the weights with indices to indicate the layer number. Assign x0 to the initial input and rename all the intermediary variables appropriately. To backpropagate the error, just like the forward pass, you do the dot product between the error and the weights and multiply by the cosine of the previous output because cosine is the derivative of sine. Rename these scaling factors to LR for the learning rate so that we can tune it as a hyperparameter. Now rerun the code. It found the solution even with two nodes, and that's awesome. Let's rearrange the code like this. If we add more layers, it will become obvious what's happening. Whenever you add new layers, the input of the previous layer will become the output of the next layer. Adding a new layer is just as simple as copying and pasting with proper indexing of the variables. You can see a clear pattern. Starting with the input, you do the weighted sum of the activations using the dot product followed by an nonlinear activation like the sine function. Repeat the process until the last layer. Then compare the output yh with the target ys. The mismatch is the error that's propagated backward in a similar way. You do the weighted sum of the error and then multiply it by the cosine of x. Finally, use the forward activations and the backward errors to update the weights in each layer. There are four main parts. The part where you define the structure of your neural net, the forward pass where the inputs are propagated through the network, the backward pass where the errors are backpropagated, and the update part where the weights are updated to minimize the error. So the entire code can fit into a page. Let's rerun. As you can see, the error is almost approaching zero. Let's try other data sets. Let's try XOR problem. XOR has two inputs, so reduce the ins to two. It solves the XOR problem perfectly. Let's try fitting some other functions. Define x's as a small range of even numbers from minus 10 to plus 10. Define the output as an arbitrary linear function of x's. Change the input size to one. Let's increase the number of the nodes and reduce the learning rate. Rerun the code. The error plot is noisy. Let's reduce the learning rate more. Looks like a great fit. Let's try another function. It fits that too. It looks like we can fit any linear function now. Let's try a nonlinear function. Okay, now we are back to non-fitting and noisy error plots. We need to reduce the learning rate farther. That looks better. Let's increase the learning rate slightly. We still underfitting. More nodes may be necessary. 
let's use 100 nodes. Again, noisy error plot. We need to reduce the learning rate. We may need to increase the number of the iterations. Finally, a good fit. Okay, now it's obvious we can fit any data if we tweak the number of the nodes, the learning rate, and the iterations. Even though a multi-layer neural network is a very powerful modeling tool, however, in its naive form, it comes with many side effects which needs to be addressed before you can use in any real-world application. First, trying to solve simple linear problems using multi-layer neural networks is like trying to kill a fly with a tank. It may do the job, but it's very messy and inefficient. Second, backpropagation is not bulletproof especially for deep networks. Imagine several people collaborating to score a goal, but they make errors. You need to blame the errors on each player correctly starting from the last player back to the first one. Two problems may occur here. Either you blame too much error on the early players, and by the time you reach the first layer, you have nothing to blame. So the early players have nothing to learn. This is called the vanishing gradient problem. Or the opposite. You are conservative in blaming the errors. And by the time you reach the early layers, all the remaining errors are blamed on them. This is called exploding gradients where the gradients become uncontrollably large. Mathematically speaking, the two problems happen when repeatedly multiplying values smaller than one or higher than one. Perfectly balancing this is quite challenging, and you can't achieve it without using some extra tricks and tools. Here is some advice. If you have a simple linear relationship, then linear regression with a simple perceptron is more than enough. If you have an unlinear but a shallow problem, then a simple neural network with one hidden layer is probably enough for the job. If you have complex nested structures, then we need a deep neural network, but we also need some extra tricks to make it work. Talking about the extra tricks, sometimes you have recurrent and sideway connections between the layers as well as various mathematical operations. You need to be an expert in math and programming to properly propagate the error in such networks. Even then, you cannot avoid countless hidden bugs. Therefore, do not reinvent every single wheel. Now you understand the basic principles, it's a good time to add a deep learning tool for our next task. Close your spider IDE go to the PyTorch website. Here, choose Conda. If you have a good GPU, choose this. Otherwise, choose CPU and copy this line. Open Anaconda Prompt again and paste the line here. Once all the installations are complete, reopen the prompt and restart Spider IDE. Now we can import Torch. From torch.nn, import functional as if. To be compatible with PyTorch, do the following changes. Change every MP to Torch. Set W's to W's required graph to true. To compute the error, set loss equal to mean squared loss, which takes YH and YS as arguments. Initialize the optimizer with zero gradients. Define the optimizer above as follows. It takes a list of the weights and the learning rate as an argument. Here, type loss dot backward. Now you don't need this part because loss.backcourt takes care of that. Type optimizer.step. Now you don't need the update part because the optimizer takes care of that. One more thing is you need to change the NumPy arrays to tensors so that they are compatible with PyTorch. Let's print the error every 500 iterations. Now rewrite the code. Reduce the learning rate Manually changing the learning rate is very tedious. It will be awesome if we have an adaptable learning rate. Fortunately, there is. Change the optimizer type to Adam and increase the learning rate to 0.003. Now the error plot is smooth, but slightly underfits. Let's increase the nodes to 200. We have a great fit. We even didn't need to change the learning rate after increasing the number of the nodes. That's because the optimizer now takes care of the learning rate to some degree. It adaptively changes the step size. For example, up to this point, the optimizer makes small steps because the past steps change its direction frequently. Therefore, the optimizer was not confident. But here, the optimizer makes large steps because its past steps are in the same direction. So the optimizer is more confident to make larger leaps. Amazingly, we can do that in the dark just by relying on the global score and our past steps. 
In programming, it's a good practice to encapsulate the commonly used parts into their classes. Define class model, move the weights into the class, and add self keyword so that they become part of the class. Define a forward function and move the forward pass to that function. We can simplify the variable names because now the optimizer takes care of all the trackings. Define the model here. Change the list of weights to params and define it as an empty list above. Then add the weights to the list once they are generated. Now we can use the model here. It takes the inputs and it spits out the output. Everything looks neat now. This part defines the structure of our network and this part takes care of the training. One important note before we generate cat poetry, let's re-examine how neural networks learn a function like the square rule. You can see it fits the training data very well with error rates approaching zero. Now let's test it on unseen data. To test the model, define a value and change it to a tensor. Pass the value to the model and print the results. You also need to append one for the bias. Let's try four. We get a value close to 16, which is correct. Now let's try minus five, which is a new value not seen by our model. The result is minus 3.7, which is not even close. So what's happening here? Didn't we fit the training data perfectly and get error rates close to zero? Well, we only did fit even numbers in our small training set. You know these oversized networks have a lot of degrees of freedom. They can fit the training data however they want. One way to reduce the crazy fit is to regularize the network. A very simple solution here is just reducing the initial weights by multiplying them by 0.1. Now let's rerun. Again, a good fit for the training data, but let's see how it generalized to unseen data now. Let's try 5. We get 24.5. Not perfect, but much better than before. When the initial weights were large, the output was complex and it was possible for Backprop to find crazy solutions just by fine-tuning one or few impactful weights. However, with smaller weights, no weight alone has a big impact and all the weights have to be fine-tuned and collaborate to fit the data. Another improvement can be achieved by changing the sign function to ReLU. ReLU fits the curve with small straight lines and that makes it behave less erratically. So now with minus five, we get 25.1. Let's try eight. It's a perfect 64. This is expected because eight is already in the training set. For nine, we get 82.4. Still not perfect, but we are getting better interpolation. Here is the real challenge. Let's try 100 which is very far from our training set. Unfortunately, the result is also very far from the target. In light of these results, let's revise our conclusion. Neural networks can fit any data, provided that we have enough nodes in the hidden layer. It can interpolate fairly well. There is a condition here. It can't extrapolate far beyond the data distribution. To be honest, humans are also bad in extrapolation. To make your neural network good with interpolation, do this. Add more data and train the network for longer times. Finally, add more constraints, like regularizers or other tricks. Honestly, there is no hard rule here. Sometimes you have a great idea, but it won't work. And sometimes you have an insane idea, but it works. In short, you have to mess around a lot to find out. Many useful applications can be built with neural networks, for instance, image detectors, medical applications, and translators. It can be used to model mapping between any inputs and outputs. Another useful application is autoregression. Here you divide the sequential data into past and future. Once you train the network on the past context to predict the future, you end up having a generative AI. You can do that for text, audio, image, or any other sequential data. Let's take language as an example. You can train a network to predict the next letter in a sentence. The predicted letter will become part of the next context. This way you can generate sentences. Let's implement that. Open a text file using this Python code. Or you can copy and paste your text between these triple quotes. I'm going to use this simple poem about cats for the training. The text is just over 3000 letters, which is considered very small but let's keep it simple for educational purposes. First, change to lowercase to reduce the vocabulary size. 
get the set of letters from the text. The neural net only understand numbers. Therefore, we need to assign a number to each letter and record that in a dictionary. Use the dictionary to map all the letters to their corresponding number. Now we have successfully converted the text to numbers. The vocabulary size is 48 unique letters. Let's move these settings here. Let's set the input size to 5 and keep the output as 1. This means we use 5 letters as input and the letter after that will be used as the output. Convert the data to tensor floats. X's are the stack of letters from I up to the input size of the next letters. Y's are the stack of letters that comes after the last input letter. Let's check X's and Y's. So all we did so far is to, pre is to prepare the text data for training. We feed these arrays to our model and we train the model to predict the corresponding outputs. Delete the bias part because we will center our data later on. Now remove plus one here because we no longer have the bias term. Now let's run the entire script. This will take some time. You can see the error plot is reducing. Let's examine the fit. We are using a context of five letters, so the fit is expected not to be perfect. Let's increase the context size to 16 letters. This will take ages to finish. It's a common practice to divide your data set into smaller batches. So let's do that. Sample 100 trials randomly from the data and repeat for each iteration. Therefore, move this part to the beginning of the training loop. Rerun the code. Let's zoom in to see how well the model fits the data. We see negative values in the output. That's because the network produces a floating value for the prediction. This can be converted back to a letter. We need to tell our network that we are dealing with categories in our output. To do so, change the Y's here to a long format. Change this to cross entropy, which is suitable for categorical classifications. We need to change the output size to vocab size. Make these necessary changes in the code. Finally, set the output size to vocab size. So basically, we do the forward and backward passes just like we explained before. To plot correctly, we select the maximum probability and use that as our predicted value. Let's fix that typo here and rerun. We have a better fit now. We can now easily convert the predicted indices back to letters. Let's do that. Set S to be the initial context. Feed S to our model. The model produces a vector of probabilities. In this case, the highest probability is for index number 15, which I think corresponds to the letter N. Here is an interesting trick. If we multiply YH by a factor less than 1, the higher probability outputs are suppressed more. This gives more chances for lower probability letters to be selected. We will come back to this useful trick later. For now, let's select the maximum probability. Let's repeat that 3000 times. Each time we predict the next letter, we will roll the context S by one step and replace the last letter with the predicted one. Define gentext as an, as an empty string and append the predicted letters to it. We also need to convert the letter indices back to alphabets. So we will define another dictionary, I to S, to reverse the indices back to the alphabets. Let's rerun the code. Finally, we print the generated text. Now you can see it spits out the memorized text. Now instead of selecting the maximum probability, sample the letters according to their probabilities. We see newly generated words and phrases. However, the overall structure doesn't look like a poem. That's because we use a small context of 16 letters, which is not enough to model the entire sentences. Let's increase the context size to 64. Let's rerun. The model spits out a memorized text, and by the time it reaches the phrase always free, which is the end of our poem, it continues with meaningless phrases. As I said, I do not expect high quality generation from such a small data set. However, I do expect that a well-trained model should be able to produce new phrases that looks like variations of the original text. The current network is very wasteful. For example, to learn the word cat, at least one of the nodes needs to activate whenever it encounters that word. The weights need to be adjusted properly so that the, no the node can detect the word cat. 
The problem is this node is position dependent and it will not activate for any other cat words in other places. Hence, other nodes need to be recruited to learn about cats in other places in the sentence. To solve that, convolution can help. The relation among the letters are localized. We can use a filter that is just the adjacent weights and move it across our context. Once the filter learns to recognize a pattern such as the word cat, it's position invariant and can recognize the word anywhere in the context. Different filters can be combined in the higher layers to produce phrases. For instance, this node can learn to detect the phrase cats fun. However, fun cats can't be detected. So we need to recruit another node for that. Generally, we want a network that's invariant to position, rotation, and scaling. The more invariant our network, the more generalizable it becomes. Let's imagine a simple filter that takes one input at a time and moves across the entire context. If we sum together the outputs from this filter, we will get a result that's invariant to both position and permutation. However, the capacity of this filter will be too small to learn and memorize any pattern. To solve that, we can represent each letter with a unique vector instead of representing it with a single value. Now, if we sum the embeddings for each letter, we will get a contextualized vector that's invariant to the position and permutation of the letters. So putting this all together, you embed each letter into its corresponding vector, then pass the embedding through a simple linear network and record the output. Then move the filter and do the same for the next letter in the context. Then sum all the outputs and pass the result through a nonlinear neural network. The output of that network will be used to predict the next letter. Hopefully, now this network can learn to recognize patterns regardless of their position. Let's implement that. Set the embedding size to 64 and let's associate each vocabulary with a random vector. X now passes through embedding. Therefore, we need to change the ins to an embed here. Change the data to long format because now we are using the data as indices for our embedding table. Now we use the fetched embedding and dot product with the weights of our filter. Define the filter weights as WV, which takes a vector of size of N embed and outputs a vector of the same size. Then we sum the output of the convolution across the input dimension before feeding it to the nonlinear layers of our neural network. Let's rerun. The output is garbage because it spits out letters without caring about their position. We need to add the position information too. You can be clever about it, but a simple way is to mark each position in our context with a random vector, then multiply it with the, with the embedding. Okay, now we get better results. Let's put the filter into its class, call the class head and move this part to the class just like before. Now we can easily reuse the class here by defining self.hits and pass the input x to the forward pass of the head. You can easily make more filter hits. Let's make an array of four hits. Then we need to concatenate the output from all four hits and this will increase the embedding size by four. To keep the output from expanding, we need to divide it here by the number of the hits. The reason for having more filter heads is to increase the capacity of our network so that it can detect various words and word connections. You may say four heads will not be enough to hold on all the possible patterns. Well, the trick is we are using distributed representation. It was only for illustration purposes we represented each word with one node. Despite learning the training data well, our model is still bad at generalization. One important reason is that we are using the longest context to predict the next letter. Predictions rely on the context length too. If the model has to predict what comes after the letter is here, then any of these letters are reasonable. However, if the past context was the word cat, then a more reasonable prediction is the space bar. To make our network aware of various context lengths, we need to pass the inputs with various context lengths along with their corresponding outputs. Surprisingly, this is easy to do. Change this part from i plus ins to i plus one. Now, instead of summing the longest context, we need to sum the inputs of the smaller context too and feed them separately to our nonlinear network. So now the network learns what comes after each context length. 
One easy trick to do that efficiently is by doing the dot product between the input and a matrix of the same size filled with ones except the upper line masked with zeros. Now you can implement that like this. Make a matrix of ones with input size, then drill the upper right half. A good practice is to change the matrix values to probabilities by applying softmax function to it. However, before applying softmax, you need to mask the zeros with large negative values so that they turn back to zeros after softmaxing. Finally, you dot product the resulting matrix with the input X. Now, after making our network aware of various context lengths, we are still going to use the longest context for our prediction. So here at negative one to fetch the last context we still can't model long-term dependencies. It's easy to model what comes right after T, but it's very difficult to model what comes after 10 steps because it depends on the context. Learning to form a proper context from the inputs is a challenging task. Since we are summing the inputs directly, backpropagation method will share the error equally over all the inputs, but that's not good for learning. Inputs need to be penalized appropriately. One of the old solutions come from recurrent neural network. In this case, we use another set of weights to share the inputs from the past to the present in a recurrent way. These weights learn to keep important letters in their internal state. To train this network, we need to backpropagate through time. But remember, we talked about the vanishing gradient problem. Well, in this case, it's even worse because we need to backpropagate through many, many steps. An interesting solution to vanishing gradient comes from LSTMs. The basic idea behind the LSTMs is to gate the inputs with a separate network that learns to reweight the inputs according to their significance. The idea is we can reduce the number of steps by attenuating the non-significant parts. Hence, we can pay attention to more important parts. Talking about attention, if every player pays attention to other players, then they can learn to collaborate better and minimize their error. The basic idea is we need to transform this matrix to attention matrix, where the values indicates how much attention each input needs to pay to its neighbors. Then we reweight the inputs accordingly. This network structure was the state of the art for language modeling up until 2017. However, it was computationally intensive and it was very hard to train in parallel because you cannot compute this part until you are done with the earlier step because its inputs rely on the output from the previous step. One group paid more attention to the attention part. They removed all the recurrent parts and they left only the attention part and it worked. This was important step because now we can train this in parallel and take advantage of GPU to scale these networks up to 100 billion parameters. Okay, now let's implement the attention part because that's all we need. First, we need to produce the attention matrix. We already had the matrix of ones. To produce the attention matrix, we use the dot product between the input vectors with itself and use the similarity scores as our attention matrix. Let's implement that. Remove the part that produces the matrix of ones. Do the dot product between the input vectors with themselves, but transpose it across the input dimension. Then normalize it. Now call that attention and pass it like this. Generally, this x called q for query and this one called k for the key. So rename them accordingly. To have a finer control over the attention scores, we need to pass the query and the key inputs through some learnable weights. Let's define these weights like this. For consistency with the literature, let's call this x v for value. Now, the self-attention is complete. One final important thing is that you need to change the multiplication to addition here for position embedding to work with attention properly. Let's rerun. As you can see, now we get better results because now instead of adding the input vectors together in a dummy way, we have the attention scores, which are used to reweight the inputs appropriately before adding them together. Now you can see better phrases and better looking structure. This is just one block of attention. You can generally stack these blocks on top of each other to form a multi-layered transformer. Let's move the attention part to class block. Now we can reuse the class. Let's define an array of three attention blocks. 
and let's stack them on top of each other. As we have mentioned before, learning becomes difficult with more layers because, because of the vanishing gradients. Another easy trick to mitigate this is to use residual connections. Think of the residual connections as convolutions across the layers. Just like convolutions share weight across the input dimension, the residual connections share input across layers, allowing the learned patterns from the lower layers to be reused in the upper layers. To implement that, just re-add the input X across all the blocks. Okay, we get an error because we need to change the output of each block to embed size so that they match together when they are stacked on top of each other. Let's fix this typo here and rerun. This will take a while, so grab a coffee. Okay, now we get a poem on cats that looks like the original poem. Overfitting happens here because we have a very small corpus and a relatively large network. So a lot of, of the phrases are just regurgitated, but there are some new made up phrases too. So we transform this rigid neural network that only learns from one context and is not invariant to position or permutation into a more flexible network that learns from contexts of different lengths and is invariant to position and permutation. This is not a standard implementation of GPT because we are still missing some details. For a more standard implementation, refer to Karpathy's awesome video. However, I would like to continue this with some alternative ideas and direction. I have been thinking a lot about where is the magic in self-attention mechanism because the end result is just a matrix of values ranging from zeros to ones, which we use them to reweight the inputs for each layer. So I try to reproduce the reweight matrix directly without the self-attention mechanism using learnable lateral connection. In essence, we are modulating each input by lateral connections from other inputs. You can think of this method as LSTM on steroids because now we are gating all the past inputs using separate gates. Let's implement that. Delete the self-attention part. We are going to define lateral connections among all inputs and call them WR. Now we use this to generate the attention matrix which now we call a reweight matrix and let's pass that instead of attention and let's rerun the code. In my experience, this method learns very well but it overfits the data if we have the same number of parameters as the self-attention mechanism. So this method may benefit from more regularization or we can simply make the model sizes smaller. Let's reduce the temperature by multiplying YH with 0.8. As we said before, this will allow us to generate more inventive text. Here it puts E at the end of storm to rhyme with the other sentence basically re-interpolating as we have discussed. If you reduce the temperature further, you may get more inventive phrases. However, if your data set is too small or if your model didn't generalize well, you will get more errors and nonsense phrases. By the way, if you have a good GPU, you can run this faster by making these slight changes. Type device equal to CPU. Right after this line, send the W's to device. You also need to send all the other tensors to device. Finally, send X's and Y's to device too. To run on GPU, set device to Coda. I have already tested a bigger model on a Colab instance with more layers and with a temperature of 0.7. So here you can see that even in the original text, the term chasing was only used twice, but our model learned to use this term in various other contexts like chasing grays, chasing milk, chasing toys, chasing in the sun, chasing strings, chasing stale, and so on. So the idea here is if you train this model on a large corpus of poetry about cats, and if you train the same model on a large corpus of texts about dogs, then we can generate a poem on dogs that's new and doesn't exist in the training set because the model can now interpolate and integrate what it has learned about dogs into a poem. 
I believe we can simplify the current state of the art neural networks much more. In the end, everything is translated to dot products and floating point operations. However, we know in principle that all the arithmetic operations are translated back to simple logical operations on binary input. So in theory, if we cut the middleman, we may find a lot of redundant operations and simplify AI to few lines of logical operations on binary on symbolic inputs. So one day we may go back a full circle. This is important because we know that neurons in our brain don't do floating point operations. Instead, they communicate with binary spikes. And if we identify intelligence in its basic essence, then we will have a better chance to understand intelligence and the human brain. The objective of any intelligent system should be aligned with human interests, but human interests are not aligned with each other. Some people say they will follow truth even if it hurts their feeling. But what's truth anyway? If the base reality is subjective, then I don't know what truth is. If the base reality is objective, then actually I still don't know what truth is, but I can entertain some thoughts. So basically our brain tries to predict the future. Now that's a bit tricky because we are not just observers, but let's talk from the eye of an observer. The truth is the path that will actually happen. Therefore, intelligence is the ability to see the path more clearly from the noise. So intelligence is the ability to predict correctly, which is the ability to compress losslessly. This has even inspired competition for compression algorithms. And this resonates well with Occam's principle, which is a simple guidance for finding more truthful hypotheses. Let's say this graph is all the knowledge that we can attain. The part inside the circle is already discovered by us. Finding new nodes inside the circle is interpolation. Finding new nodes outside the circle is extrapolation. Ideally, we want to discover new emergent nodes with minimal trial and error. Let's say we have two models, a big model and a smaller model, but both are capable to fit and explain the discovered knowledge inside this circle very well. From Occam's principle, we should trust the smaller model more because it has more potential to extrapolate truthfully. Now what's the smallest possible model that can fit all of our discovered data? The theory of everything which physicists are looking for is probably the smallest possible model. If we apply this model recursively to the initial state of our universe, then its output can predict the Big Bang event, the emergence of galaxies and planets, and the evolution of life up until the current point where we are trying to predict the next letter in the sentence. But that's too much computation just for predicting the next letter. Also, it's not possible to compute the model of our universe faster than itself. Therefore, even though the theory of everything is the most truthful model, it's useless for predicting the future because we can simulate it faster than our universe. All the other models, even our mental model, have some degree of uncertainty. So probably we can never find the absolute truth and we are cursed to live with uncertainty. Thanks a lot for watching. Stay tuned or watch a related video.